Okay. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on this special day. Uh, my name is Shuli Kurzan van Gelder, and I am the Director of Planning, Evaluation and Partnerships in Mashab, Israel's agency for international development cooperation. In recent years, we have started a tradition of, to marking international days that are relevant to Mashab activities, and today we are marking the World Safety Day. Uh, thanks to Mashab's Agricultural Center for organizing this day, and we hope you'll enjoy it. So, uh, thank you, Shuli. Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation was launched 60 years ago to share the know-how and technologies which provided the basis for Israel's own rapid development. Mashab aims to empower those living in poverty in a holistic and innovative way and support fellow nations and communities in their struggle to achieve sustainable development, placing people at the heart of its initiatives. Our agricultural programs use unique techniques and farming methods to increase sustainability, food security, and hunger eradication. We believe that investment in education is an investment in our future and an agent for change around the world. We coordinate Israel's official humanitarian assistance, building medical facilities and supplying medicine in the wake of earthquakes, floods, famine, and other disasters. Mashab promotes innovative entrepreneurship as a means of advancing growth and prosperity. We believe that gender equality and women's empowerment are central to reach sustainable development. Our philosophy is to leave no one behind. During six decades, Mashal has trained over 300,000 people from more than 140 countries and has established development projects worldwide. Mashal, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation, is celebrating 60 years of sharing its experience and partnering for a better world. Okay. So, welcome again. My name is Professor Nirol Haad from the MANA Center for Food Safety and Security at Tel Aviv University. I am thrilled to see so many participants from all over the world. I can recognize some of our graduates. So, this is a very uh, important and thrilling moment for us. This is a joint venture with Mashab from uh, um, the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and uh, Tel Aviv University, and we are very pleased and glad to have today with us uh, Professor uh, Aaron Truen. Uh, he is the head of the Nutrition and Brain and Health Laboratory at the uh, Faculty of Agriculture at the Hebrew University. And he will open uh, this uh, joint webinar uh, presenting our lessons from the COVID-19 uh, here in Israel on food security. Aaron, please. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm delighted to be here, and I was I was very uh, excited when uh, Neil uh, reached out on behalf of Tel Aviv University Manus Center on Food Safety and Security, and uh, on behalf of Mashav to uh, participate in this uh, initiative. Um, you know, he just gave my title. I direct a nutrition and brain health lab, and you might ask, well, what's a brain health person doing with food security? And the the issue that I've come to realize through my research on basic research on the brain and its relation to nutrition is that oftentimes we give recommendations for the relation between a certain diet or a certain nutritional adequacy and health, um, but it isn't necessarily a matter of lifestyle choices that people make, but rather their life circumstances which affect their ability to obtain optimal health. And if we need to deal with food uh, nutritional circumstances or life, life circumstances, then really the food policy um, side becomes highly important. And over the past uh, several years, uh, much of my research and um, activity has been focused on 
looking at ways to measure and alleviate food insecurity in Israel um, and uh, to deal with nutritional inadequacies in Israeli uh, society um, by improving the food system um, in order to uh, deal with some of these problems and make sure that people can realize their full human potential and society can achieve um, adequate human potential. And so when COVID came upon us, um, I was asked uh, along with several colleagues um, to put together a position paper and look at what has happened in Israel in response to the pandemic um, with respect to food security or food insecurity and the disruption that it has had on our food system. In a sense, um, the COVID pandemic can be seen as a kind of stress test. Um, and while some of the conditions are specific to Israel that I'll talk about, I was struck in, in looking at these issues by themes that have emerged and recurred globally as the pandemic spread. And so while I don't have any very hard conclusions that will be uh, necessarily specifically relevant to each and every one of your countries, I think that you'll find that there are a lot of themes that resonate and we may have an opportunity here to learn from each other, uh, which is why I'm so glad to be here today. And when we look at COVID as a stress test, the first thing you may want to think of is that it finds weaknesses or pressure points in our food system that become disrupted and uh, interfere with the way in which we provide food for ourselves normally. Um, there's another question that emerges though, which is what the relation is between the disease and nutrition um, biologically and what that tells us about our need to make sure that our food systems, our nutrition in each of our countries is adequate so that we don't um, see a worsening uh, or an exacerbation of the severity of disease and uh, worsening of outcomes. Um, this relates both to the problems of prevalent obesity and to micronutrient deficiencies, both of which are part of the uh, dual-edged sword uh, of malnutrition and malnourishment. And finally, uh, perhaps we'll, uh, in conclusion, we can discuss some of the common themes in policy and in the political responses to food insecurity that are highlighted by the pandemic and um, which uh, may be common both to high-income, middle-income, low-income countries. In fact, the same types of issues that are dealt with each in their own context. Um, it would be interesting to try to look at some of the commonalities as well as the differences. So let me just uh, do a sharing here first, uh, share one of the uh, first screens. Okay, is that up? I can't hear the hosts. Is, is everyone seeing the shared screen? It's not yet on. For some reason, the screen is black. It says that you're sharing something with us, but the screen is black. Okay. Uh, let me try this one more. Do you see it now? No, nope. not yet. We did do a trial run and it worked in the, uh, in the preparation. Let me see if I can do this differently. I don't know why it's not sharing properly, but I'll try to share it um, simply from the PowerPoint. Are you using um, the split screen? Maybe it's because if it's on a split screen? It, it could be. It, do you see this now? Not yet. I'm sorry, I don't know why this isn't working. I'll tell you what, I'll just talk it through without the sharing um, and we'll see what we can do.
The truth of the matter is that having more uh, of a PowerPoint uh, battery of slides and data points um, really isn't the key issue um, that I want to speak about. Um, and maybe I can share some of the slides uh, through Mashav and uh, Tel Aviv after the, um, after the uh, uh, webinar. Um, what I wanted to begin with was uh, to show uh, a slide uh, uh, generated, an infographic generated by colleagues at Tufts University, um, making the point that food and nutrition are going to be critical to the current and post-COVID-19 response. And they map out several areas um, of interest where there's an intersection between nutrition, um, food policy, food systems, and the response that we have to the disease, some of which are, are basic science issues. How does uh, immunity function when we have micronutrient deficiencies? What are the nutritional requirements that we need in order to be able to mount an effective response and reduce the disability um, in the disease? How does obesity affect the um, course of the disease and the um, exacerbation of inflammation, which leads to the severe presentation um, and severe morbidity and mortality? Um, but there are also uh, major issues that have to do with disruptions to the food system. What happens to agriculture? What happens to the ability to availability of food and the food supply chain to the workers who harvest the food? deliver it to the cities, who distribute it in the retail? What happens to the consumer response to um, closure and the need to provide food under difficult conditions where access is limited? What happens to food prices? What happens to imports and the trade, international trade of food? Um, and that these issues will disproportionately affect different sectors in society, not only um, in the economic sector of the food system from the farm to the fork to the uh, food services, um, tourism and so on, where hotels may close down, where markets are closed due to closures. And so the demand and supply are very disrupted, um, but also in terms of uh, the um, economic distress that that produces and the uh, major rise in unemployment, the shutdown in the economy, the effect of the stock markets and downturns that then impact people's ability to buy food. Um, there are other issues that have to do with health disparities that are structural and endemic in our societies, whether we live in high or low or middle income countries, where people who are um, poorer are disproportionately affected and harmed by disease on the one hand and lack of access to food on the other, particularly when employment is affected and when um, food prices rise. Um, those populations tend to be sicker and have greater proportions of um, obesity and chronic disease, non-communicable diseases, which are associated with poverty and food insecurity. And therefore they're rendered more susceptible to the disease. One of the things that I found uh, uh, very interesting was that when the pandemic began, there was a, a kind of sense that, wow, this is hitting China and Italy and Europe and the United States. We have a, a health emergency here, which isn't a third world problem. It affects everyone. And there was a sense that somehow COVID was going to be a universal um, situation that everyone would rally around, mobilize around and deal with because it would affect everyone equally. And in fact, what we've begun to see over time is that that is true to a certain degree, but even within societies, between societies, there may be a, a greater effect and greater impact on those who are more disadvantaged. And so on the one hand, it's focused attention internationally because everyone is involved and everyone is affected globally. On the other hand, there's a question of what lessons we're going to draw from this situation to make sure that those who are and most vulnerable and most at risk are not left behind and to make sure that the spirit of cooperation and collaboration continue and triumph over the tendency to uh, bunker, bunker down and um, protect one's own resources, whether it's getting uh, masks or disinfectants or a vaccine for ourselves first and only then distributing it to others. The same would be true of making sure that our food reserves are available, 
both for all societies, but to make sure that we maintain free trade so as not to create barriers and disparities which will harm others around the world. So there seems to be an interesting parallel between some of these issues which are true within society when we look at equity and distribution and the impact that this has on nutrition and health and internationally as we look between countries with different resources and different um, economic standing. When we look at Israel specifically, Israel is a high income country and it, I, I'm sorry I can't show you the slides, but it would be interesting to think that when we look at Mashav and our agricultural prowess and our ability to share this knowledge around the world in order to promote food production and food safety and security everywhere, globally, um, one doesn't typically think of Israel as a food insecure country. And indeed, if we look at our food status based on FAO data, um, we have absolutely adequate food supply to feed the population. Um, the average per capita um, calorie availability is roughly 3,600 3, uh, calories per capita. Uh, that's far more than anyone needs. Um, in fact, maybe part of our obesity epidemic. Um, fruits and vegetables are also in abundant supply with roughly half a kilo per person per day. So overall, on average, there shouldn't be an issue. Um, we produce a great deal of our fresh produce, dairy, poultry, and fruits and vegetables. Um, meat, red meat is imported, as are our staples, the grains and oils that we need to maintain our total food system, calorie supply. Um, that is largely through import. We don't have uh, large grain reserves. We don't have large oil reserves. And about 90% of our food total is imported. So on the one hand, we seem to have an abundance during routine times. Um, and on the other, we are vulnerable to disruption of supply and trade. Um, and that's a, a major concern when we think about food security from a national uh, perspective and a national security perspective. And in fact, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, we went and looked at our uh, strategic reserves and found that they were not adequately stocked. Um, there isn't a lot known about this because these are also um, strategic and security issues, but it raises a question of what each of our countries needs to do in order to maintain those reserves in the case of a disruption, because we found that um, the supply of food, even though it hasn't been majorly disrupted um, internationally in international trade, there have been all sorts of pressures, such as the locust uh, plague in Africa, uh, a failure of uh, banana supply in, in the Philippines and in uh, uh, Southeast Asia, where those are staple foods and very important. Um, Russia has created restrictions on the exports of grain uh, for the time being. So these issues are, are going to be very important in uh, the World uh, uh, Food Program and the FAO the United Nations have called not to restrict trade and to make sure that we don't worsen the disruptions by taking national actions that can have impact. Um, but I think all countries are going to be aware of this going forward and thinking about how we manage um, to achieve food sovereignty. Um, this has echoes in discussions of globalization generally and whether or not the pandemic um, and even simple things such as the restriction of travel are going to erode uh, the tendency towards globalism and or not. Um, when we look at Israel's um, uh, food insecurity, despite the fact that we have abundant food supplies in routine times, um, there are very large wealth disparities within society. And the socioeconomic data show that about 20% of Israelis from the beginning of the uh, early 2000s um, are regularly chronically food insecure. Food insecurity being measured by the uh, US Department of Agriculture Household Food Security Questionnaire, um, which ranks people's subjective sense of being able to access food, not necessarily the availability side and supply side of food. Um, and this is largely due to poverty or relative poverty in this case, um, where the lower quintile of the population, in order to buy what the Ministry of Health would define as a healthy food basket, would have to expend 
of their disposable income. What we know that they actually spend from economic surveys by the uh, Israel Central Bureau of Statistics is about 42% of their income on food. The 23% gap is reflected in purchasing of low quality, high energy density, high calorie starches, oils, sugars, processed food, which is rich in energy, but poor in nutrients. And so we see in this population that they don't buy as much dairy, they don't buy as much fruits and vegetables, they don't buy as much poultry, fish, and meat, and the quality of the diet is just lacking. Um, that results in about a fourfold prevalence of obesity, diabetes, and non-communicable diseases in this sector of the population. Um, when you look at the people who are poor in Israel, it's very easy to say, oh, we the other political groups that we don't like. This is true, by the way, politically around the world where poverty and welfare are, are, can be very contentious politically. And you can say, well, maybe it's the ultra-Orthodox, they have very large families and some of the members of the family don't work and there's high unemployment and so they live with a lower income per capita within their family and therefore they can't afford to buy food. Why should we support people who make cultural lifestyle choices? The same could be said of the Arab population. But when you look at the data, in fact, it's a whole range of people throughout society, single families, people who are in disability, people who have um, lost their jobs recently. Um, and now this becomes very important when you look at it because the pandemic has created an immense rise in unemployment. We went within three weeks from a 4% unemployment rate to a 25% unemployment rate, where previously we spoke about one-fifth of society being food insecure and maybe a quarter of Israeli children, and now we're looking at a quarter of the workforce being out of work. That effect, even with the opening of the economy again after the closure, is going to have a, a long-lasting, long-term effect because particularly small businesses, independent people, have lost their jobs, lost their livelihood, and businesses that collapsed aren't going to come back and be resurrected immediately. So if we had a problem going into this with 20% food insecurity, we're going to have a much larger problem now going forward that will require a major response. If we think about the current government response, well, this is something that has been seen as a tolerable level of insecurity where welfare benefits are generally distributed through employment means through the National um, Insurance uh, Institute um, and are part of the base of the budget. The government has been reluctant to allocate budget um, or money in the budget as part of the uh, entitlements, where if the population grows, you have to, by law, pay. Um, the population of those in need grows and by law you would multiply that by the budget in order not to create an incentive for people to be, let's say, out of the employment uh, sector or to have large families or to deal with this issue where you have to balance moral hazards and the moral obligation to help people with need. And so part of the policy response has been lagging, um, but in around uh, 2011 uh, there was a, a National uh, Nutritional Council um, that was uh, created, National Nutrition Security Council that was created to advise the government and they came up with a plan by about 2014 that was supposed to be a public-private partnership where the money that it would cost to fill that gap of food, that lack of food for food insecurity, would be allocated by the government through NGOs, large food banks, which are already existing, which have infrastructure, people, and capacity to take food surplus, whether it's staples from um, the food industry or agricultural su surplus from farmers and redistribute that to those in need. And there are in fact several Israeli organizations, Latet and Leket Israel being uh, perhaps the largest, that are very efficient with the logistical model that says food security is really a technical problem of taking food that's available for free that otherwise would go to waste and just redistributing it to those in need. Now, this raises a whole host of ethical issues um, but during the pandemic one had to say you know does this work can this succeed 
even at the beginning, the onset of the crisis, when houses were closed, when, when, when people were closed in their households, and employment plummeted, and businesses stopped, and the supply chain was disrupted, a model that relies on volunteers and philanthropy in the third sector, in the non-governmental organizations, in order to fulfill some of the role of providing for need and poverty in society, faces a real test in the pandemic. And what actually happened? Um, first of all, people uh, learned that they were going to be closed off at home and they said, oh my God, what are we gonna do for food? So there was a rush on the supermarkets and much as uh, was seen in the rest of the world, eggs disappeared from the shelves. Other kinds of staples disappeared from the shelves. Toilet paper disappeared from the shelves. No one really knows why people were hoarding and stocking up the toilet paper. But this sudden demand, this spike in demand, created a need for certain kinds of foods that couldn't be provided for on a regular basis. We have enough chickens in Israel to provide enough eggs for everyone on a regular daily basis. But a chicken can only produce one egg a day. You can't say to the... Um, poultry industry, okay, let's, let's uh, up our, in, our, our production now because we have a pandemic. So almost immediately the eggs disappeared from the shelves and they were rationed at the groceries. On the other hand, um, open air markets closed. Open air markets closed and they, they uh, account for about 30% of Israel's uh, uh, fruits and vegetable trade uh, commerce. And those open air markets were closed because we couldn't have crowding and all of a sudden the produce that was coming from the farms for those markets didn't have a market. Hotels were closed because tourism and foreign travel shut down. And so all of a sudden the uh, catering industry and the restaurant industry and the hotel industry and big institutional kitchens didn't have to order food. So there was no demand for those fruits and vegetables. So the farmers that catered to those supply chains wound up with surplus, but they couldn't harvest and they couldn't pick. Foreign workers were closed off and at risk of disease. Foreign workers tend to be relatively poor migrant workers. And so they're at risk for the disease as well. And so you have a problem of labor in making sure you have agricultural production. On the other hand, at the same time, in order to make up for this loss, we imported food. So eggs were imported and fruits and vegetables were imported because there was a demand for food. The prices went up in the groceries and so the lower prices and make it easier to have supply, you just import it. So that creates a very clear disruption. And this wasn't only seen in Israel. I mean, there were reports of, of pasta being um, scarce in Italy. Um, when you think about what happens to the um, food banks, they're now saying, okay, there's all this surplus. We need to get it out to people who need it, but we don't have our volunteers because typically we rely on the volunteers to provide that connection between our supply and demand. Like in Israel employs about 50,000 volunteers a year. They deliver food to 200,000 people normally. So now they're trying to deliver food to 300,000 people, but they don't have the volunteers. And their income, because they're non-governmental, comes from philanthropy. And the philanthropies tend to be wealthy people whose money is tied up in the stock market and the stock market crashes. So all of a sudden there aren't resources available, readily available to provide for the system. So in a sense, this public-private partnership is designed to try to maintain some balance of food supply and welfare um, during routine times where there's ideally an emergency response to people who fall upon hard times and help them get a leg up so that they can leave the circle of poverty, but they become a chronic instrument and then they can fail when there are pressures like in the pandemic. That's not to say that they failed entirely. They did mounted a heroic effort to help distribute food and damage. But there needed to be a national response as well. And one example is um, the elders who were closed off at home now and couldn't go out to buy food. So in order to provide for about 130,000 homebound elders, who are at risk of COVID and you didn't want them wandering around in, in public, even with face masks and hygiene. Um, they took the school food program, which in Israel feeds roughly 260, 300,000 children who are socioeconomically deprived. They're not going to school. 
So that food could be reallocated and was remarkably reallocated. I think Ramit Envelt is on the call today. She's head of our nutrition division at the Ministry of Health. And Enat Badikhi in the Ministry of Education said, okay, let's get together and see if we can do something to shift it. And one of the lessons in Israel is that we're very good at improvising. Not always good at strategic thought, but we're very good at improvising. And there's a very flexible, dynamic response to the emergency. So they were able to take the food and the budget and take the caterers who otherwise would have gone out of business because they're not providing to the schools anymore. And they took that food and figured out how to deliver it to the, the adults. And they did that by looking at the welfare and at the volunteers and the expertise of the food banks who knew how to distribute food. And they called in the army. And soldiers were used to develop uh, the, the um, National Guard or the Home Front Command was involved in distributing food. So you had some interagency collaboration and you had some uh, uh, private public or governmental, non-governmental cooperation in order to mount an emergency response. And I think there was a very big sense of national uh, mobilization and collective uh, solidarity to try to respond to this pressing need. However, when you improvise, you wind up with a problem. What are the children who aren't getting their food? So the food banks found ways to distribute maybe 30,000 meals to some of the children in need in the cities where they had good access. And the Ministry of Education found a way to distribute about food to about 18,000 children who are at the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. Um, but that left of those 18,000, that left leaves another 10 times as many who are still um, reliant on food uh, and the food supplementation through school who aren't getting it. And so one of the things we have to look at going forward in Israel is making sure that we have some contingency plans in place for all of these types of issues um, going forward. Um, and that, that won't be easy, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I mean, I think it won't be easy because if you look at these issues in normal times, they are politically uh, very challenging. Um, distributing money for welfare is always an issue. Figuring out what kind of solidarity and obligation we have to people is always an issue. Do we want to support our farmers and make sure that we have local food sovereignty? Or do we want to um, rely on imports so that we can lower food prices and avoid tariffs so that we can make sure that we have um, cheap, affordable food for those who are food insecure and in need? And in some ways, these different, um, um, different solutions or different um, problems uh, have to have a balance where there are different contingents, different constituencies, different political forces, and uh, different uh, values at play in order to try to balance them all out. And so my hope would be that uh, in light of this stress test, in light of the problems that we've seen, we'll recognize that we need to do a better job and perhaps come to a different balancing point in trying to set up a, a better food system. Now, another that issue that has come up in the food system is this issue of um, obesity and our poor food system overall. What's the quality of the food that people in Israel actually eat? Now, some of that we grow, we have great fruits and vegetables. We, we said there's availability, if not always economic access. Um, but we also have uh, multinational corporations who produce ultra-processed food and who control, in a very centralized way, much of the food system. And that's been an issue that the government has been trying to deal with, at least on the Ministry of Health, public health side, um, by food reforms for food labeling, for trying to cre create uh, restrictions on marketing of uh, snack food and, and sugary beverages to children and, and the like. Again, these are, are major issues in countries going through a nutrition transition um, and in countries that are wealthy around the world. We all know about the global obesity pandemic. In Israel, um, the rates are that uh, roughly uh, 24, uh, a quarter of uh, children are um, overweight or obese. And as I said, this problem is far more prevalent among people who are disadvantaged. So when people were isolated at home, the rules in Israel were that you were allowed to leave your home for a radius of 100 meters, unless you were going to do something essential 
um, you were an emergency worker or you had to go and buy food or get medical attention. And so people were confined to their home for uh, a considerable period of time. And of course, when you're at home, it's very hard to get out and get exercise. Um, and in a survey that was conducted by uh, Brookdale Myers Institute, uh, they found that about 65% of households had a reduction in physical activity. 56% of, uh, of those surveyed responded that they were eating more. 43% increase of snacks and sweet intake. Um, when you look at people asking whether they needed help to buy food, 46% um, of the households reported having an economic downturn and nearly 25% uh, of people said they needed help procuring food and that went up to about half of all elders. So this was very uh, significant and people have done a calculation to say that that would result in roughly a five kilo increase in weight. I don't know if that number is actually, uh, or that estimate is entirely true. Uh, but I can tell you from my own experience, I've put on weight, even though I'm a nutrition scientist and I should know better. Um, that issue will only serve to worsen our normal health issues, which are chronic and very expensive health issues um, for society. Um, but it makes it even more serious when you look at the fact that COVID predominantly um, causes severe disease and mortality in those who suffer from diabetes and from uh, chronic illnesses that affect the immune system and result in heightened inflammation. So that's something that we have to think about before the second wave as well. What can we do about our response? Not only the nutritional response on the one hand, but how do we support a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle and maintain people's ability and mobility to maintain their physical um, exercise and physical well-being? which has enormous impact on mental health and mental well-being. And we're seeing the results now of the stress of the pandemic, the social isolation and the closure in much higher rates of domestic violence, in much higher rates of depression, mental illness, and there's concern that that will actually manifest in a wave of uh, um, uh, suicide going forward. Um, so those of my colleagues who are concerned about mental health and uh, uh, public health in that response, in that respect, um, see a connection with the way in which we close ourselves off and the way in which we feed and maintain our, our, our day-to-day well-being. Um, all of this, and I, I see the time is going on, so I'm gonna to try to leave wrap up and, and leave time for questions. Um, when, I, when I've been looking at these issues in Israel, you know, one of the first things we've done is to look at the international literature. And there has been a proliferation of literature on COVID, a disease that wasn't known before this year. Uh, there are now roughly 17,000 scientific papers out on, on all aspects of the uh, disease and countless more um, uh, position papers, popular press uh, and think tank uh, reviews and so on. One of the things that I find heartening and positive about this is that there has been a spirit of solidarity and international cooperation, sharing of knowledge, sharing of data. And that allows us to see that what's going on in Israel is not only going on in Israel, that these problems are not only problems that we face and that we confront alone. And in fact, this Mashav Tel Aviv University webinar is an indication in, 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 of that spirit that by getting together, even in an acute emergency, we can provide information, best practice, knowledge that will allow us to find better solutions um, going forward. And so my, my litany of, of these issues, we, we tend in science to deal with pathologies. Um, I actually like to think in terms of the positive deviance and the solutions and focusing on what we can do right in order to uh, move ahead. And I think that the uh, flexibility and the solidarity that we've seen emerge in Israel within civil society, the collaboration with the government, um, that has all been very positive and there's been a tremendous uh, outpouring of engagement. Maybe even because people sitting at home want to figure out what to do so that they can contribute their energies to solving the problems. Um, and that needs to be encouraged and it needs to be encouraged structurally 
And I think institutions, universities have one role in that, in bringing people together um, as we're doing today. Um, government institutions have an opportunity to uh, share in that outreach and bring people together. Um, and I think overall that's uh, very positive. But again, through that kind of international collaboration and sharing of information, these issues of the local disruptions of the food chain, of the need to support farming, of the need to look at health disparities and support people who are going to fall in hard times. Um, the fact that these hard times are not in the 4% of the population who might be chronically unemployed, but are now affecting 25% of the population in Israel at least, means that everyone looking left and right and ahead and behind, looking at our parents, at our siblings, at our children, at our friends, our colleagues, our co-workers, we're all in this together. And I think we have to remember that um, in, in, in thinking about our solutions. So the local and global issues are um, have a lot in common. Um, I, I was I gave a webinar um, with another opportunity to speak to an international audience. And I was struck after my comments on food insecurity in Israel, uh, I, was, I was humbled by uh, a woman from Sierra Leone who is involved in her response back home. And she said, yes, in Sierra Leone, we're also dependent for 90% of our um, uh, food on imports. But in Sierra Leone, when I talk about food insecurity, we have a three-day closure because most people are subsistence farmers. They have to go to the field, harvest their food, bring it to market, and come back home and do the same thing the next day, or they will starve. And so we can only close down for three days because otherwise they can't get enough food to market. It disrupts people and puts them at risk of starvation and death. So we're not in the same boat in that regard. And I think we have an obligation to think how we, how we share our, not only our knowledge and our experience, but how we share our wealth and our capacity and our ability to provide support for those in need internationally, globally. But there are parallels in, in my abstract thinking between the way in which we view others and the way in which we view um, food as a central human good and a central right. Um, and if it's a right, then it has to be protected and provided for, as well as being a commodity. And we need to understand it as a commodity and an economic commodity that has to work within the, the, the rationale of the marketplace that we, we have constructed. So in Israel, I'll sum up with this. In Israel, the um, recommendations that uh, we came up with um, in a, a broad coalition, uh, Professor uh, Ohad was a part of this, um, together with the heads of um, all the nutrition schools in Israel, all the schools of public health, um, non-governmental organizations, the food banks, food promotion, uh, health promotion, uh, um, uh, NGOs, and so on. Um, a very broad coalition submitted our, our recommendations and they, they really said that in the immediate time, in the immediate term, the first thing we need to do from a national security perspective is make sure that we have enough food in our reserves. There needs to be a much better mechanism, at least in Israel, for providing um, a national food plan. We have no master plan for food in Israel. You can look at the Ministry of Trade, Ministry of Economy, Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Agriculture. Everybody has their own Ministry of Education. Everyone has their own portion of this food system, but there's no overall um, body that coordinates and consolidates the policies so that they include support for agriculture, support for sustainability, support for health, as well as all the other dimensions that the food policy needs to have. Um, and so we hope that that will be carried out quickly. And again, when I look to the international community, um, there's been an enormous amount of work, particularly in low and middle income countries, that have 
national food plans that look at food as a human security issue and even as a national security issue. And I think it would be nice to see if Israel could learn from that international experience. Um, but in the immediate term, the next thing that we need to make sure is that we have a system of making food immediately physically accessible to those in need. The elders, the school children, the families who are at home, those who are chronically food insecure, and those who are newly food insecure all need a way of getting food when we close down society. We need to be able to um, support our farmers and our agriculture locally during times of emergency. And I think greater thought needs to be made, uh, put, put to that immediately. In the middle term, I think that we need better information systems. Here maybe it's my scientific bias, but I think that we need to be collecting data. We need to be able to understand this problem far better so that we understand and identify those people who are vulnerable and those sectors of society who are vulnerable and that we can target them, particularly if we have to go house to house to deliver food, we need to know who these people are individually. We need to be able to collect and maintain and manage that data those data and then understand how we how we limit the problem um, as a matter of routine policy. We also need to have soon we need to have a discussion about our economic policy and how we make sure that food prices are set at a fair price where everyone can achieve, everyone in society, even those who have low income, can achieve at least a healthy food basket without relying on, on welfare. Um, we need to be dealing with these chronic issues of obesity and malnourishment through policies like food fortification, which Israel doesn't have. I didn't mention that one of the micronutrients which may well be relevant to, um, to severity of the disease, particularly the respiratory distress, is vitamin D deficiency. Even though we're a sunny country, Israel has a very large prevalence, particularly among elder people, of vitamin D deficiency. And it could be solved with very simple measures of food fortification. And yet we don't have a food fortification policy. So that's one of the issues that we're working on promoting. That needs to be done with some urgency. And in the long run, we need to see that these issues are really budgeted for by the government and that we build up capacity, that we train people to look at professionals, dietitians, nutritionists, public health officials, and people in the agriculture and environment and economic sectors to look at food as a major strategic issue which affects our well-being um, and the welfare of society in general uh, over time. And that, uh, again, my own academic bias is I try to train nutrition scientists and I try to train dietitians and I try to train them to think not only in terms of what the dietary guidelines are, what the recommendations are, what we need to eat, but if you're trying to give recommendations to someone, make sure that that person can actually act on them, has access and availability of food and um, can make sure to obtain the food they need in order to realize their full potential and live full and uh, nourished and, uh, and good lives. And with that, I will end and take comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Aaron, very much for this uh, very delighted and uh, enlightening uh, lecture. Uh, you, all our participants are invited to write uh, their questions uh, over the chat, and uh, we'll go through them one by one. While you do that, I just wanted to um, comment that I think that one of the things that we have noticed here in Israel that the epidemic has affected uh, much more severely the urbanic area rather than the rural area, even though, as Aaron pointed out um, very well, the, the problem of uh, our agriculture uh, communities, which suffered mainly uh, economically, but almost not at all uh, on uh, health-wise, uh, at least by, by disease itself. And this is because of isolation of communities. And I wonder, and maybe Aaron, you want to comment on that, and maybe we'll have some questions from our audience, to what extent uh, this happened also in other countries, mainly in uh, countries where agriculture is much more intense uh, in, in their economics. 
So I'll, I'll just comment briefly um, from what I've uh, heard from uh, colleagues uh, like Will Masters at uh, Tufts University, uh, an agricultural economist. Um, he said that understanding these issues, you have to start with the epidemiology. And the epidemiology shows that the spread of the disease is highest in cities and urban areas. And when you get out to the rural areas, the farms are isolated already. They typically don't suffer in the first stages of the disease, but the disease eventually spreads out to the farming communities um, much later. So they're isolated. They have access to their own food um, and are, are less severely hurt because they don't have the problem of the supply chain disruption, of the physical isolation, and of the severity of the burden of disease. Um, but over time, that shifts. And I, I don't know, I don't know how we're going to see that in Israel. Most of Israel's population is, doesn't live on farms. Even the rural communities, they may live on farm land, but they engage in um, in, in other occupations. So um, I think that uh, it's not surprising that Israel was predominantly in the urban areas. And I, I, I'd be curious to see what people think uh, around the world in our audience. So, Tommy, do we have questions from our audience? Yes, we have quite a few questions. Okay, uh, so uh, Yehale asks, in pandemic cases, um, consuming fruit is not advisable. How can we protect losses and go and going into crisis? Uh, I'm not sure that consuming fruit is not advisable. Is that an issue of... Uh, uh, would you be more specific? Uh, well, it's, it was written, so um, okay. Is I'd be happy. Is, is, is there any relation between consuming fruit and uh, the uh, pandemic? Not that I know of, um, except to say the dietary patterns where people have um, better quality diets, which would include fruits and vegetables. Um, would tend to have better nourishment, okay. at least in, in, um, in, in our experience in, in Israel and in other high-income countries. Um, perhaps the other issue, would, yeah, perhaps the other issue is just hygiene, and maybe it's recommended when, because uh, fruit and vegetables, if they're coming through markets and they're passed through different hands, maybe you need just to make sure that they are washed before consumed, uh, but that would not affect by nutrition, as, as I understand from Aaron. Okay, another question. Uh, Claudia asks, what foods are best for fortifying our immune system? You know, there, there are no foods that are specifically for the immune system. When you say that something is for the immune system, it's often a marketing claim. And uh, it's typical of uh, vitamins and supplement companies that make their business by saying vitamin D is for the immune system. What we know is that deficiencies harm the immune system. You don't want to actually boost the immune system. If you boost the immune system in those terms, you create an overactive system. And that's part of the inflammation that can be harmful in the disease. So the terminology we use, good for the immune system, is, is problematic. What's clear is that deficiencies of vitamin A, of vitamin D, of vitamin C, of zinc are all harmful for the immune system. There's relatively good observational evidence that deficiencies in those nutrients, micronutrients, will be associated with increased um, uh, disease and uh, severity of disease and respiratory infections. And with regard to vitamin D uh, specifically, there's been a very um, interesting meta-analysis of 25 clinical trials, randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials in 15 countries around the world, showing this was pre-COVID, obviously, so it may not relate specifically to COVID, but showing that acute respiratory infections um, are, are reduced in people who receive a small supplement of vitamin D, particularly, particularly when their starting vitamin D levels were low. So people who are deficient in vitamin D who are supplemented with a normal dose, not with a bolus, not with a major dose 
but are supplemented and brought up to a normal level tend to suffer fewer respiratory infections compared to those who were given placebo. Now that's an average of 25 of 10,000 subjects in 25 clinical trials. So the signal may not be very strong, but the extent of protection among those who had low vitamin D was a roughly 70% reduction in, in disease risk. Now, if you take the standard evidence-based medicine approach and you say, look, we have to do, we have a hypothesis now, we have to do the definitive clinical trial, then we have to wait around and wait for people who are deficient to be exposed to COVID-19, to give them vitamin D versus a placebo and see if there was any benefit. Now, I would argue that may not be not only feasible, but not ethical. We know that vitamin D supplementation is not um, harmful, at least not at high levels. So the doses that we're talking about are a thousand international units per day. If it has benefit that may be significant, it's not going to be the major protector. It's not going to cure the disease, but it may have benefit for some people and would probably be advisable given that we recommend that people supplement themselves to avoid osteoporosis or rickets or other conditions that are, are for the skeletal system, I'm sure for respiratory disease, um, under normal conditions. The problem is when you say, is this good for COVID? And where that allows people to then try to use this to make a profit and promote cures that are not cures and provide um, recommendations that are, are misinterpreted and, and can cause harm in that way. Okay, um, another question. Uh, you said that uh, Israel entered the, uh, this uh, crisis fairly, um, with a fair level of, a high level of uh, food security. But what about countries who entered the crisis with a low food security? Um, is this crisis an opportunity for them? Um, if yes, what do you think they should, what should, ha what should happen now so that they make the best of it? Boy, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think it's, uh, uh, I, I think that the, the, the data show that there's going to be increased pressure and that the United Nations uh, has said that uh, they expect a doubling of hunger and severe food insecurity around the world. I think the numbers were from 120 million to, to 250 million by the end of the year. So in some respects, no, that the pandemic is going to increase pressure and make things worse. Uh, my comment on making things better is really that when you have a crisis, it focuses attention and one has a choice in how to respond to a crisis. So every crisis is an opportunity to change the way we do things, to change business as usual. And in that respect, I think the World Food Program, the FAO, international organizations, and importantly, collaborations between people like ourselves who are saying we need to be doing things differently, um, have an opportunity to make some changes in the way they do business, to go out and, 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 and shake the uh, foundations of, of their governments and say, we demand action. We need to be doing things better. And uh, if we don't, we're really going to suffer. And we're not really over the first wave yet internationally. And we don't know what's going to happen next. And until there's a cure, we all know this, until there's a vaccine, and the vaccine is widely available to the 10 billion inhabitants of the earth, we're still going to have to deal with this pandemic. And if not this pandemic, the next one, which is going to come out sometime in an unexpected way. We have to be prepared. And so I think when I say the opportunity is there, international agencies that provide aid to low-income countries are going to be mobilized. The demand will be greater, but I think that there's an opportunity to work together and work more effectively than we have perhaps in the trying to meet this need. Okay, uh, Frederick asks, what is the incidence of obesity in Israel? Um, roughly 30% of the population are overweight or obese. Okay. And is there a direct relationship between the, the COVID-19 and obesity? Yes, the data for Israel and around the world are that um, the dominant um, feature of those who wind up on ventilation and die and have severe disease or hospitalized with severe disease are obesity, diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, some cancer, some immune issues. Okay. 
but it's it's obesity and diabetes again and again and drivers. Okay. Um, Claudia says thank you for mentioning the mental health issue. It was important to her. And uh, Aska asks, COVID may lead to drastic malnutrition um, in dietary quality, threatening uh, maternal and child health, um, directly or indirectly. How does Israel prevent this? And a big shalom from Indonesia, he said. Thank you from uh, Indonesia. Um, I, I think that the that, that's a very very important issue you raise. If if we're not talking about clinical cases, people who have come down with COVID and have mothers who have severe COVID, um, then uh, we're looking at the general infrastructure that we have in Israel for dealing with women and infant care. Uh, we have a, a relatively well developed. Uh, women infant child program um, that does routine healthy monitoring and tries to keep track of nutrition and, uh, and health. Um, so those issues are monitored and I think in uh, well, Anita's now showing up on my screen. Um, I don't know if she wants to comment, um, but uh, maternal and child health is a central theme in any of the national health policies that are divine, designed to try to improve our food system. Can we ask Olnit to comment on that? Olnit, you're unmuted. Okay. Uh, thank you for, uh, for this lecture on it was, I think, very important. Uh, I, I would like to comment on another thing that you mentioned. Uh, there was a question about uh, if uh, food can contribute to the immune system. And you remarked about uh, nutrient, several nutrients that might help. But we know in general that malnutrition do damage the immune system and also sarcopenia. So uh, also obese people who suffer from what we call hidden hunger or lack of nutrients do have uh, problems with the immune system. So it's not certain kind of food, but it's the, the whole nutrition um, uh, combination and uh, the following the nutritional guidelines is is the cure for the immune system in general, of course, with physical activity and other things. But there's the reason to believe that the healthy nutrition do contribute to the immune system. Not certain food, but the diversity and the, sure. the, the, the healthy nutrition also is part of the immune, immunity. As for the uh, care for children, uh, a certain thing which is very important is to continue to give the good uh, care for small babies including breastfeeding and including immunization. Because the, the thing that was in, in problem now in Israel is that many parents were afraid to come to the clinics. So they didn't immune the small babies. And th this is a big problem because uh, the other disease than the COVID-19, of course. And uh, about the breastfeeding itself, in general, the accommodation was that even a woman who is a uh, sick with COVID-19 should continue a uh, breastfeed, but uh, she should take care that she won't, uh, that the disease will not be uh, transferred to the baby by covering her face and, uh, and washing her hands and, and things like that. But lately there were a few studies from Germany, if I remember, if I recall right, that there were a few uh, babies that were got COVID by breastfeeding. So uh, I think the literature is not final for that part. But in general, the recommendation mm -hmm. for continuing breastfeeding uh, is the general recommendation by now. Uh, with, of course, the, uh, the limitation of if the mother is very sick or she's not able to take care of the baby. Thank you very much, Lonit. Uh, I just for those who joined in and didn't hear me mention her earlier, uh, Professor Romit Envelt is the head of our nutrition division and health promotion in the uh, Ministry of Health and has been a major figure in leading our efforts on nutrition and food insecurity uh, and the COVID uh, pandemic in general. So thank you, Lonit, for those important comments. Okay, so we have some more questions. Um, Esther asks, how is the food safety situation in Israel during the COVID-19 situation? Um, what interventions have been put in place to ensure food safety and not just food security? And Frederick um, 
joins in this question asking on food safety, um, how do traceability mechanisms operate in Israel compared to maybe to other parts of the world? That is a good question. It's not in my area of expertise. I don't know if Neil can uh, uh, respond. I'll just say that as far as I know, there was a lot of deliberation over food safety initially, whether or not, uh, just in the sense of whether or not the food could be trans the virus could be transmitted through contact with food. And the recommendations were, um, I know the FDA guidelines were that uh, it's not a major risk. You should wash your uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and maintain the same kind of uh, stringent um, food safety um, uh, rules um, in general in, in throughout the food chain, in food production and in the groceries, um, masks, hygiene, washing, etc., as you would normally. Um, so I think that's generally been the response. If people, I can see Juanita's waving again, she may have something to add. Is that true? Do you want to nod? Yeah, I may add that they food safety was even better than in general times because there was a lot of cautious because of the COVID-19. And uh, for example, in the lunch program at schools and kindergartens, uh, in general, children now are encouraged to, to take themselves to food and prepare their own lunch by giving the food and they can choose whatever they like. Now they are not allowed to do it. Only the teacher could give them and serve them the food. So it is, Less, less contamination and uh, food safety is even higher now because of the cautious, because of the COVID-19. Uh, and in general, in Israel, uh, the food safety is, the, is the managed by the uh, Department of uh, Food Services. And uh, there's a lot of people taking care of it in Israel and it's quite high, I must say, comparing to other Western countries. Of course, there are some times that there is problems with uh, germs that comes like uh, salmonella and hysteria, etc. But it's uh, coming less and less common. But there was no, no, uh, no infections during the COVID or due to COVID. There was no intensif intensification of such cases. Rather, they were uh, lowered because of the way people consume food and because most of the restaurants were closed. And even in restaurants, you know, the, the possibility to get infected is less by the food because you're cooking the food. It's more by infection from person to person. This was blocked simply by closing these services. Right. Internationally, people have seen uh, uh, food transmission in industry. I don't, I'm not aware that we've seen any of that in Israel. The uh, meatpacking um, industry has been particularly severely affected. Um, partly because people work in close quarters um, in a refrigerated, humid environment where um, it's uh, very difficult to maintain physical distancing and um, people are low paid workers and there have been outbreaks in numerous food packing, um, meat packing uh, plants uh, across the United States and Europe. Um, but we, we haven't seen that here. Okay, we have uh, another question. Um, how, how has food security been manifested um, in Israel geographically, or has it? Um, are, there more, are there cities that have uh, suffered uh, greater uh, food insecurity than others? Um, generally, no. The answer is that food insecurity is not distributed um, evenly geographically. It's distributed across socioeconomic uh, uh, regions. So if you look in what we tend to call in the Israeli discourse, the periphery, in peripheral cities, one would see greater prevalence of food insecurity. And that, that hasn't changed uh, in, in light of the pandemic, as far as we know. That's not to say that we've done a new survey on food insecurity during the pandemic. I think that's one of the, um, when I talked about the midterm response that Israel has to take, those are data that I think we certainly need to be tracking and we need a mechanism for tracking them. Um, but up to now, I, I don't think so. It, bear in mind, it, it's a very small country. We, we take an, up an inordinate amount of space on the newspapers, but geographically, we're very compact. And, um, and the food system generally is very centralized. There are several logistics uh, distribution centers and um, the food industry generally has been defined as an emergency or necessary vital industry. And so people continue to work and continue to distribute food. There wasn't, um, 
there, there wasn't a breakdown in delivery of food, so the access has still been maintained, except where I've told you it's broken down, people not being able to go out themselves, that they're elderly people who don't have money to procure food, and those disruptions to various commodities which don't appear on the shelves. Um, so other, but that, that was distributed pretty evenly across the country, rather than geographically. Um, you mentioned uh, quite a few times the, the supply chain, and uh, the, I have two questions that are related, one from Ronald and one from Adesina. Um, how will the government uh, help um, ensure the continuous supply chain, and what measures have they taken or have they taken at all to help um, the farmers in Israel? Well, um, that's, uh, that's been a, a, a contentious issue. Overall, the government um, allocated roughly 80 billion shekel, that's uh, give or take 20 plus million dollars, um, to relief efforts. And they tried to distribute that along different um, vulnerabilities in society, not, obviously not only food, but uh, in the economy in general. Um, there have been attempts now, it, it, and it's been a moving target. I think one of the characteristics of this, I told you within, in the month of March, within three weeks, we went from four to 25% unemployment. So a lot of the effort has been to say, how can we bring people back to work now without creating another outbreak? Um, and they saw the closure as a temporary um, stopgap measure in order not to overwhelm the health system, not to overwhelm the hospital and reach the kind of uh, rates of death that we saw in, in countries in Europe like Belgium and Italy and Spain and France. Um, but the issues are going to be more and more important now as we look at the long-term economic disruption. And in that regard, um, the farmers have been vocal in saying we need support, but so has everyone else. And bear in mind that during the same period, um, we didn't have a government. We only had a government formed in the middle of this outbreak of pandemic. And we didn't really have a functioning uh, parliament and parliamentary oversight. And so some of the responses um, have been slow in coming. As I said, there's been a lot of uh, improvisation by people who are in the civil service side of the government um, and decisions that were taken by the government to do, take care of the emergency response and focus on the health. And we're coming out of it now with a newly established government that's composed of, um, it, 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 it seems that there's, um, it's supposed to be a unity government, which means that it has a very broad majority in the parliament, but that was done by cobbling together a coalition of different um, parties with very, very divergent um, social, economic um, platforms, as well as foreign policy platforms. And I, I don't know how that's going to work out. Okay, I wish I had a better answer for you. Okay, so uh, time is getting short, so we, uh, we'll just take two more questions. And uh, the first one is uh, from Anna, who would like you to, to say a few words, if there, if, if, if there is a connection, about uh, the um, security, food security um, and uh, environment. Um, because we know that the COVID, we, there's a lot of talk that the COVID is going to affect uh, um, have some effect over the environment, but um, how do you think this is going to affect also um, from a food security point of view? Well, the, the, that's a, a wonderful question, Anar, and, and a topic for a whole other seminar. Um, so because we have to wind up, I'll, I'll try to be brief. First of all, the fact that the environment is um, under assault and climate change is uh, only one uh, major manifestation of that, um, that impacts our food security all along the chain. So uh, that, that's a major issue and, and clearly um, issues uh, like the uh, Eat Lancet initiative um, and the United European Union had just published a major policy uh, paper looking at food systems overall 
And the idea is that when you try to deal with these problems, you cannot only think in terms of agricultural production if you harm the environment. So we can increase yields by using more pesticide and fertilizer. It's clearly not the way to go. Um, there's a lot of work in Israel on uh, precision agriculture. I'm trying to increase yields locally. I'm trying to avoid the um, excesses that we've learned um, and have been rightly criticized by environmentalists. And so trying to make sure that we can produce food in a sustainable way, environmentally sustainable way, that doesn't increase our carbon footprint and that doesn't increase the harms to the environment and our exposures and harms to our health through pesticide and, and, and overconsumption of land, land use. Um, all of those issues really need to be put together in a, in a overall global policy. That's certainly part of the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations and is something that uh, uh, people at the Faculty of Agriculture at the Mana Center in Israel generally in Mashab were very, very attuned to. So that's very important. Um, how the um, issue of, of maintaining food security will affect sustainability, I'm, I'm not sure. Are, are you in our Abbasov? Would you like to clarify the question? Let me unmute you here. I think I have that privilege. Can I do that? There you Thank go. Thank much for your uh, clarification regarding the, how those environmental issues could, uh, co could, could be considered during those, uh, let's say, pandemic situation. Of course, as you mentioned, uh, kind of uh, those, uh, let's say, uh, environmental issues should be kind of taken in during the whole overall process of uh, agricultural processes. But uh, in this case, uh, the map, uh, kind of specifically, what I wanted to hear that how those, uh, as you mentioned, those uh, approach to increase the fertility, for example, or increase the, uh, let's say, provision the population with the food security, uh, with necessary foods, etc. How it's correlated to the. Uh, overall environmental related approach of the country, for example. So, so in Israel, the demand uh, that we've made or, or the position, and demand isn't the right word, but the position that we put forward is that when we call on the government to solve these issues and create a master food plan, it must, absolutely must contain the uh, overall um, uh, view of sustainability. We want to make sure that we have a sustainable, health-promoting food system. And I think much as it, it, it's hard to square, the, the reason food policy is so uh, terribly, uh, wickedly complicated is because there are trade-offs that have to be made given our current state of technology and the different needs that we want for foods, cheap food, abundant food, healthy mm -hmm. food. They don't we haven't succeeded thus far at putting all of those pieces together, and yet we are far more aware now that we need to do so. And I think that's where all of, uh, uh, you know, and when I look at the, the uh, horizon and state of the art of the research arena, that's where research is directed now. And mm -hmm. that's where policy work is directed. And so the fact that uh, a neuroscientist like me is talking about sustainable health in all policies uh, approaches um, and sustainable <laughs> development is an indication that this is part of the parlance. And there's no question that I think going forward countries, and, you know, we're going to, those of us who are involved are going to try to make that happen in Israel. I think it's true for all of us. We need to ensure that we have sustainability. And I think it's a false, we have to try to avoid the false or dangerous um, political use of the argument, well, we have an emergency, we need to feed people so we can throw sustainability out the window. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing, zero sum game. I think that we need okay. to look at, at more of a win-win approach where we involve these elements in any general policy and we, we move them all forward together even if it's going to take us perhaps um, a little bit longer and the solutions won't be as uh, blunt and simple and obvious as they would be simply by saying, well, oh, just give everyone food, <laughs> you know, increase <laughs> your farms, cut down the forests, plant the plant crops. We need to be yeah, uh, uh, mindful of that. And that will, by the way, that will require international cooperation again, because we all have different resources. And one of the ways in order to protect your own environment is by utilizing 
the resources where someone has the availability of the land mm -hmm. and, 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 and trading and negotiating and dealing with these things in a way which hopefully will have some measure of uh, cooperation, collaboration, and a, a sense of the common good rather than focusing on the how am I going to win at someone else's expense, again, in some kind of view of, uh, of international relations and politics and trade. Of course, in terms of kind of, of uh, global climate uh, change, uh, like uh, global warming, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it's uh, kind of it's becoming more critical to have uh, to take con into consideration such a approach with regard to the kind of addition uh, with farmers with necessary support, with necessary subsidies, and uh, to also kind of uh, to make some balance between the environmental issues and with uh, food security problems. Yeah, I, I, I think I think you're right, and um, the there have been a lot of um, there's a cartoon that I like that I was going to share, which uh, shows two children standing and facing cyclones and thunder and lightning and hail and rain and waves, and they say you know, climate change, and they say oh we should have called it a pandemic, because <laughs> I think the the immediacy of the pandemic has focused people's attention on something that's happening here and now and needs an immediate emergency response. There's no question in my mind that climate change is an emergency and needs a concerted international response. Um, and I, I'm very concerned as to whether or not we can, as, as an international community, maintain our, our global affinities to help do what's needed. Um, and, and uh, you know, you look at that issue as well as I do in, in recent to friends pre-COVID, um, I hope that after COVID, we'll do a better job going forward. Okay. Any um, more questions? Very true. There are a lot of a lot more questions, but we won't be able to take them all. Um, I'm going to limit us to one or two more. So there is a question from Tran Li. Tran Li, um, what trends do you think uh, will, will will be seen in food production, or what uh, what what trends of food production can be stimulated or pushed by the pandemic? For example, organic food or GMO food? Um, I don't know. Maybe Neil has some comments on that. I, I, I think from the perspective of Israel, what was really interesting to see is that in response to the overall challenge of, um, that the farmers faced, and the challenges of providing the food and the, the disrupted demand and supply balance in the supermarkets. Um, there were a whole variety of initiatives um, to try to connect to more people with applications on their iPhones. You could, uh, an artichoke farmer who had surplus that was going to go to waste had an app, you could order artichokes to the home. And the people who were unemployed now suddenly were serving as delivery drivers. So you had the high tech and the unemployment uh, and the farmers come together and create these new applications. We saw an outburst, obviously local delivery, delivery to the home became a big deal. I mean, it took two weeks to order from my local supermarket, but there were workarounds. Um, that's, not, that's not quite what you were asking in terms of GMO or, or organic, um, but I think and, I, and I'm not sure how the long-term changes, GMO and organic are, are going to be structural issues within the system, the agricultural system. If the COVID pandemic goes on for a long time, I'm not sure that GMO and, and, and organic are going to be the main changes, uh, but I do think that people are going to look at uh, trying to make sure that their food supply is robust, that they have access, and they may be looking for these solutions to be able to provide food, and in that context, healthier food from local freshly produced agricultural produce, as opposed to um, perhaps the uh, um, uh, processed food from industry, which, which you get from the supermarket if it's uh, available. Neil, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and I see also Ronit, Ronit wants to, to comment on that. So tell me if you can open Ronit microphone while sure. I'll give just a short note on this. Yeah, I think we're in the midst of, of an event that we cannot really uh, still I predict how it's going to develop and I don't see yet any relation between what we're observing right now and the long policies that needs to guide us in terms of using organic and and uh, GMO 
I think all considerations that we had in place so far are holding still. Uh, I think the most crucial point is at this point is to maintain our food uh, chain supply to look into availability and accessibility at this point and also in terms of utilization to have enough of the of the economic to to provide people to purchase their own food and then to cook them so uh, i think only if uh, if covid will will be with us unfortunately more than what we would like it to be here and that is to end it as soon as possible then maybe these will sum up or will add up to considerations that we cannot predict right now Bonnie. I think there's a difference between what we would like people to eat and what people are eating. And what we would like people to eat is that we would like people to have much more natural foods and much more like Mediterranean kind of food and uh, much less ultra processed food. Uh, but we have to understand that uh, still the ultra processed food is cheaper and uh, we have to, to see that the healthy foods will be much less expensive. That's a, a really critical thing to do. We are working toward it, but it's not uh, yet then. And uh, I think that one of the things that we have to think over is that maybe the COVID-19 will not vanish at the end of the year. And maybe we have another wave, a higher wave next year. And there's a connection between sustainability and the vitality of the viruses. And the, the food chain, we are, we are doing a strategic work with the Ministry of Economics, the Ministry of Agriculture and the Army in order to, uh, to build a strategic stack if other countries uh, we limited the amount of food they are exporting to Israel. And that we have to build a, an agriculture capacity in Israel in order to, to have like some kind of nutrition independence. And that's, I think, one of the issues that we have to encourage in many countries, because any country cannot be independent totally nowadays, but at least for a few months and for the main uh, a food that gives the most nutrition to the people, we have to, to be independent. So this, I think, is the need for looking into global policy since uh, it is believed that uh, worldwide, I think we have enough food to supply the entire population. It's a matter of uh, um, negotiating and bring the policymakers together, not to limit supply and to help and open the chain supply through different countries in order to prevent exactly what you were talking about, Ronit, and that is limiting supply of food to those countries who are not independent. Okay, um, no more comments on that. Okay, so last question. Um, and uh, this is uh, a question bringing us back again to, uh, to Africa. And uh, Bridget asks, in preparation for any possible future pandemic, how can we ensure food, food security and food availability at a household level in a village setup, especially in Africa? Oh, oh, well, uh, <clears throat> the big question, I saved it for... Well, Africa is a big, big place with a lot of different countries and a lot of different conditions. And I, I don't know how to give a, 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 a total answer for Africa any more than any other place. But I, I would think that you need to look at your... If you're talking about villages, you need to make sure that the villages have some measure of self-sufficiency and that they have infrastructure and transport and water to, to allow for um, uh, not only their own growth, but the importation of the food that they need locally. And you, you have to have a food system which is robust and resilient. Um, Neil, do you, you were gonna comment on that. Yeah, no doubt that uh, governments and uh, local authorities need to look ahead now into to these problems before they even develop and to try and make the uh, their plans to, to try and, uh, and um, support those communities ahead of time. Because once you hit that uh, wall, it will be very difficult to react. And in view of what we're seeing already in other countries, uh, you have to take into consideration that uh, this epidemic will or may affect those uh, villages and especially in rural areas and in low income uh, societies, 
you have to prepare in advance. Um, that's what I can say. On the other hand, what, I'm very glad to see here among our participants, people who have been trained in Mashab, in, uh, both in the Hebrew University and Tel Aviv University. And I see those as our, our, our um, ambassadors and our well-trained people who can uh, make the gap when other countries and other NGOs are leaving places such as Africa in view of, uh, of uh, COVID. Uh, it is that uh, this generation has been trained and has the knowledge and at least can communicate back with Israel wherever we can help. Uh, I see this as a one way to try and and fill in the gap to to get assistance. I, I, I'd only add to that, you know, when I look at these um, Hollywood Square Zoom screens, um, at the faces that show and the faces that don't, uh, it's frustrating not to have the ability that you would have in a classroom or a conference to be able to just talk about these issues, to have a full um, back and forth discussion. And I suspect that the person who asked the question actually has some answers that they would like to provide. Um, my guess is that uh, each of you, you know, Neil spoke about our ambassadors, but I think that there's a, it's a two-way street or a multiple-way street there needs to be in this thoroughfare a great deal more conversation than we can uh, possibly afford on a Zoom webinar. Um, but uh, I'm sure there are ways to continue to converse and I'd be very happy to um, uh, correspond by email. My email is up in the corner of this uh, uh, screen. Uh, Mashav and uh, Neil can uh, provide uh, access as well. And uh, we should be continuing these discussions because that is part of the preparation we need to make uh, for tomorrow and uh, for the better future for us all. Yeah, yeah so uh, I thank you all for uh, attending us and joining us today to this uh, special event uh, for the Day of Food Security. And I thank Aaron and Mashal uh, for uh, arranging and organizing this meeting. and. Uh, I hope we'll be able to meet uh, sometime soon again on uh, on such events. So s s keep safe, take care, and uh, hope to see you soon. Great. The webinar is going to is recorded and it's going to be uploaded on uh, both the Mana Center um, web website or Facebook, right, Nia? Right. And, and on the Mashav MATC YouTube channel. So you are welcome to, to share it with friends and to view it again and again for all of the interesting information that is in it. And thank you also to Professor Troen for this uh, very interesting talk. Thank you for having me and a special shout out thank you to uh, Professor Enveld for uh, thank you. Uh, joining in and adding to the team. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Hello. Nice, nice seeing all of our graduates also and all of our people who have been training here in Mashal. Yes. Take care of you all. I see, I see a lot of friends here. Goodbye, everybody. Hello. Shalom.